surprised in these last days. You know, when they see that they're they they're not stepping on, they're not they're not well grounded in, in in the in the in the present truth, right? Right. What's that verse? Is that uh, take heed lest you think you stand, or take yes. heed lest they stand lest they show, lest they fall. Yes. And then the, the the foolish the foolish virgins. You know, the word foolish comes to you know when the the, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about, a lot about the foolish, and and it, it relates it to the people who who are in sin. You know, um, the wise are those that fear the Lord and and depart from sin. So uh, I see people that are, uh, you know, just like us. We have the lamps, our Bibles. We have the we have some oil in it, the Spirit of God, and we are preaching that Jesus is coming. But in our hearts, in our lives, we have sin. You know. And it can only be one sin, just one can spoil everything, you know. So I believe if we want to be awake and 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 see the times in which we're living, we first need to, um, you know, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, like Paul says. Right. I totally agree. I, and um, if you actually kind of read it as the verse, but there's there's um, passage where it talks about how we um, um, the, Ad the early Adventists during this time, what had the result of the disappointment wasn't like those, those who had stayed faithful. The result of the disappointment wasn't a, um, you know, wasn't them falling away or getting, you know, completely hurt. And well, I mean, of course they were hurt and they were disappointed, right? But it wasn't them rejecting or forsaking the truth. Rather, as they continued to study, it was them. Um, coming to repentance and you, so you can see that this was truly a movement that was led by God despite some of mis some of the bombs and misunderstandings along the way um, and I kind of wanted to, Damien mentioned this last paragraph of uh, page 393 um, one thing that had really stood out to me was so we talked we covered impulse um, we covered about the importance of having a personal experience, right? That faith in God and his word. Um, but the other one is that they took their lamps and they took no oil with them. So this is interesting because we're not talking about people outside of the church anymore in this in this context. We're talking about God's people. Um, but there's, there's going to be two classes of God's people. And we might not even be able to perceive it now in this present age. We might not even be able to discern that it might be us. So, so that's why heart searching is so important. But notice their characteristics is that they took their lamps, right? But they didn't take the, took, took the oil with them. They didn't have the, the Holy Spirit with them. He wasn't the one that was leading their study. He wasn't the one that was driving their uh, their repentance, their revival and reformation in their lives. Um, so they still were in, they were they were in the faith. They were doing everything that they needed to do, uh, but because they didn't have that personal experience with God, um, that personal that that infilling of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't stand. Um, they weren't able to proceed. They weren't ready to meet the bridegroom when he um, when he was ready, though he tarried. And notice that everybody you know fell asleep. All of all of the virgins had fallen asleep. So these are just some interesting points. I wish we could dwell on dwell on them more, but. Um, I'd like to progress through the rest of the chapter because there's a lot of interesting things that we can learn from this period um, of, um, of our early, early faith. Go for it, Mario. I was going to mention something very quickly um, about the about the, the foolish uh, versions. As I was uh, studying the other day, I found out that uh, there is a characteristic of uh, a foolish version what what foolish versions of people have and yes uh talking about people from the church but um i was looking at job in the chapter two right after satan basically attacked uh, attacked job's health and his wife said to him you know do you still hold fast your integrity basically just curse, curse god and die and job said to her that you speak as one of the foolish women speak. And when I thought about foolish women, and in her case, it is not just people that do not, uh, that do not take um, oil with them, but there are people that possibly had some oil, but then because circumstances turned around, then they were quickly... Um, going to turn their back on God and basically 
be acting as though God never done anything for them. And you can see that even today, some may be in the faith, and then something bad happens, and then they just turn their back on God, and basically they start to say that God is not who he says he is because they don't have their own way in a sense. Wow, great point, Mario. Thanks for bringing that up. That almost reminds me of the parable of the sower, right, with the good seeds. And those seeds had fallen on, uh, or who had fallen on thorny ground, right, the richness of this life, or those who had fallen on rocky ground. And when the sun shone, they couldn't, you know, they weren't able to, they weren't able to grow. They didn't, they couldn't withstand through those trials in life. Great point, Mario. That's really interesting. Um, so, yeah, definitely cir certain circumstances. Um and as Christians, that's why we, we see in that the early church's example that their faith in God's word and not just faith in God's word, but their personal experience with him, that they, the two have to go hand in hand. You can't have one out of the other. And I think that's where the enemy tries to attack at is that he tries to say, well, you know, you know, X, Y, Z verses. You have such a great knowledge of uh, Bible scripture. You know, you're going to be able to stand in the end time because of your knowledge. But if the Holy Spirit hasn't filled your heart and hasn't given you that experience with him to where you love him and you're obeying him and you're, you know, you're growing in faith and like what Josh had mentioned, forsaking sin, then it's, it's, you know, useless and not on the flip side that you can turn into a fanaticist and or into a fanatic and dwell on just experience alone and be driven by every wind of doctrine or every feeling that you might feel. Um, so what, another quote um, great controversy, the first paragraph of 394. In this time of uncertainty, the interest of the superficial and half hearted soon began to waver and their efforts to relax. But those whose faith was based on a personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath, the feet, beneath their feet, which the waves of disappointment could not wash away. So despite, um, once again, kind of harping in on that point, is that despite the disappointment that they were experiencing, despite um, the trials, the discouragement that, the, you know, of the perception that God let them down or whatever, you know, they, they, they had that personal experience with him. They had a knowledge of this. And so they were able to um, continue in that. Um, Damien mentioned, and this is kind of going off of um, the last part of paragraph 393, where it says that they had, um, they had a, they had their own they had their own oil right in their lamps um going off of the sorry the experience of the ten virgins the five wise virgins they had oil in their lamps and that tells us that salvation is individual um we're not saved because we are seven day adventists we're not saved from, because of the membership of the church or because of the faith in our families some people might think oh well i grew up in the Adventist church right and that's what something i always tell my youth is that um it's easy to say like i'm okay i go to church every sabbath i read my bible i have a devotional we have family worship but salvation is individual you need to be the one hunting and searching your own hearts um, having God examine your ways, you know, and see if there's any wicked way in you, not us, right? Of course, us. There, there is, um, there is time for us as a church um, where we, you know, you see the um, for us as, as a church to humble ourselves and to pray um, collectively, but ultimately begins with one person. And if you see in the example of Achan, it, um, do you guys remember the? The sin of Achan when he was in the in the camp, it mm -hmm. just took one individual um, for the for God's power to be completely neutralized in the whole nation of Israel. So it just takes one individual. We're talking about salvation here, right? So salvation um, is individual. Um, so in Great Controversy, page thirty nine. 395 paragraph 3 it says that no man is proved to be a true christian because he is found in the company with the children of god even in the house of worship and around the table of the lord this is what damien was mentioning that satan is frequently there upon the most solemn occasions in the form of those whom he can use as his agent um how do you guys what do you guys think about that like how do you what do you I don't know what your experience is with um, other members of the church and conflicts that might arise. Obviously that, um, you know, there might be disagreements between um, other, you know, members of God's, um, God's 
fold or, you know, among the other people and that during the house of worship. But based off of this quote, Satan is frequently there upon the most solemn occasions in the form of those whom he can use as his agents. What, what then should be our response? Do what you think as, as Christians when, um, you know, I guess certain conflicts or, um, antagonizing events i suppose may arise um in god's house right people think perceive that god's house should be a perfect place right which we know is not is very it's not always the case um but with this in mind what do you guys think should be our responses well i think um in paragraph 396 where it says the devil said miller has a uh, great power over the minds of some uh, and at the some at the present day and how shall we uh know what manner of spirit they are of the bible answers by the fruits you shall know them and so i think that's like you know something to, to look at as like to judge yourself according to the word of god not according to what others do or what you see um, other people doing mm -hmm. what? Um, oh go ahead okay. Josh. i don't know who's going but the the enemies of christ the the worst enemies of christ were from from, you know from his own side from his, his own people you know um and and you can see that um those that don't improve the light that god has given them are subjected to even worse darkness than the ones that have never known the truth you know so this is the reason why they are the worst enemies of god but that that's that's one part we, we should test the spirits by the word of god but the other is that we should be careful too, because one slip, one um, a little spirit of uh, selfishness or you know self confidence can can just depart us from God just one second, and we might be used by Satan himself, you know. Wow. Um, so before we start seeing other people, you know, we should see be careful for ourselves, you know, because you know the same David that 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 worshipped God and you know brought people to God's temple to his sanctuary was the same one that was killing Uriah. You know, he, he, was, he was the one that was doing a lot of evil stuff too. Um, and that's to tell us that, you know, we should be careful not to, not to think we're, or to feel so overconfident, you know, sin has like, um, I just read has great power over the mind. It's just this great struggle between, you know, we don't have this, this warfare against flesh and blood it, it's spirits you know it's evil demons you know they have six thousand years of experience and we should our only defense our only refuge is jesus christ if we don't see this he's going to use us as he pleases you know and and we might we might look very nice we might speak very nice we might even speak the truth but if if, if we're too self-confident like peter saying and he's gonna sweep us off our feet like, like he did with Peter and just a matter of hours Peter was denying his Lord you know mm -hmm. uh, the same thing is gonna happen to us if we do that and I've learned that in my experience very true um, I was thinking of That's the good. sorry go for it Brian I was thinking of the Satan's agent um, you know sometimes what happened is mostly I believe uh, Sister White did say that Satan's agents will be uh, those that were in the truth and that let go of the truth. And they'll be the bitterest enemy of those that are proclaiming the truth. And we can, we can see it as some people may be having a form of um, repentance and this, they they are seeking to come back in, but they still have they are still um, half converted. They they still want to live just as the world, but with the with the Jesus Christ label on. Therefore, if they have that label on, then in a sense, they can give that appearance that they are indeed converted. But of course, in those solemn moments, uh, I think that is when God will actually show his power to, to give us the understanding of who is his people and who is not his people. I 
I think of, um, thank you, Mario. Thank you for those thoughts. You are right. Um, and and I, I'm grateful that God gives us that discernment too. I think it, as we start to progress, um, there's going to be a sifting, right? You, you hear about that um, sifting that even um, is going to take place. And even those we think, you know, who are stars, um, those they too will lose their light. And so, um, so going back to the, you know, that thought that salvation is individual. Um, think of this passage in Ezekiel chapter 18, which is really um, sobering. It says, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The, soul, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So everybody is to stand alone, right? You are to, your faith is your own and you're, you are responsible and held accountable for the, for the truth that you have received and how you have lived up to the light. Um, Romans 14, 12, each of us are going to give an account to God. Um, talking about the foolish virgins, once again, in, in Great Controversy, page 394, paragraph one, it says they all slumbered and slept. One class in unconcern and abandonment of their faith, the other class patiently waiting till clear light should be given. Um, yet in the night of trial, the latter seem to lose to some extent their seal and devotion. So notice that uh, even among the faith, you know, the wise, the uh, although they were patiently waiting, they still kind of there was some bumps along the way. There was still some some. Um, I guess you could say like a dimming of their light. Um, the half-hearted and superficial, they could no longer lean upon the faith of their brother. Each must stand for himself. Um, so once again, you know, our faith is our own. Um, when the foolish were asking for some of the oil from the wise, there wasn't going to be enough to go around. They had to have had their own. Um, you are responsible for you know, we are, each of and every one of us are responsible for how we're living up to the light that God has given us and how we are, um, and if we are, um, okay, so then that kind of, oh, sorry, did you have something to add, Damien? Yeah, I was, was going to add, um, and I don't, I don't know if I'm getting to add, but uh, this is in 395, where it talks about uh, Paul, Paul and Luther. I'm not going to go ahead uh, and read the whole thing, but um, you know, both of them suffered a lot, you know, um, and through what, you know, what they went through. Um, but overall, like they, they didn't put their own ideas or like their own, you know, they weren't opinionated, you know, but rather they, they chose, you know, to, to focus on the word of God and, and you know, on that, on that alone. I don't know uh, if anyone else like had, yeah, uh, I, guess, like, I guess going back to what, like, uh, you know, uh, to that quote that we were that you were sharing on three ninety four point three ninety four point one is that um, others abandon their faith you know, their faith while others you know waiting patiently and by waiting patiently you know that doesn't necessarily mean to just you know sit around but you know to diligently read the word of God or to be prepared or, yeah just like the okay yeah. point. I think I think people could take the word patiently in the wrong way sometimes and I, I mean I'm speaking for myself. And being patient doesn't necessarily mean like just to sit around and wait. So I mean, it's not like some sort of phlegmatic, um, mm -hmm. passive thing, right? It's an it's an active um, it's an active verb in the Christian right. world, right? Great point, right? You look at like people like Luther and Hebrews eleven kind of talks about that, that like those who had waited for the promise, right? But when you see when you look at Abraham who's waiting for the promise, he's not just waiting for the promise; he's actively obeying God. Um, what God tells him to do at every point at every stage of his life. If you look at the um, the early reformers like Paul, Luther, Wesley, um, Zwingli, they're not just passively waiting um, and phlegmatic. You know, it's not like a, you know, let me just monk out and you know read the Bible, right? But they're actively sharing their faith too. Um, I, they're actively you know participating and living out the life that God wants them to live. Um, actively sharing their faith. I think I just mentioned that. Um, so yeah, great, great point, Damien. Um, definitely right about that. Um, one question that did come up, um, and I, I, I get this a lot with the youth in my church, is that if um, if salvation is individual, then what is the purpose of the church? And I'm going to ask that to you guys before I kind of come up with some things that I, I gathered from 
from this chapter. If salvation is individual, then what is the purpose of the church, right? And, and this is so important now, right? Because churches are closed, church buildings are closed. So what, what then was the purpose, right? If salvation is indeed individual, if it is, then why can't I just, you know, be content with, you know, spending Sabbath at home or in nature by myself? Um, what's the, the important? I think it, it definitely serves as a preparation, you know? Kind of like, uh, like the 10, going back to the 10 virgins, you know, like, uh, we could, you know, we could be like, you know, part of the 10 virgins that are in the church. Um, and we could either have, you know, choose to have that oil or choose not to have that oil. Um, and then, you know, afterward, obviously, you know, we're, that's, it, it's a test. That's where we're tested. You know, we diligently seek the word, you know, do we ask God, you know, for instance, you know, um, or are we like the foolish, you know, virgins where, you know, we just, you know, go with the flow, do whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christ, Christ gave us an example and um, he, he gave us an example so we could follow. Um, and, and, and the way, you know, in the Bible, that the way to, to heaven is, um, is clearly marked by, by how he lived. Um, and he lived an unselfish life, you know, he gave his life for us. Um, we are we are social beings, and and um, and yes, even though we are saved individually, um, we are part of a of a body, you know. And the Bible uses the the term of a body because you know, just as the body has the different members, we serve in different capacities to help each other out. You know, the, there's a lot of young people right now that aren't going to church because of this, you know, because they believe, you know. It, Salvation is individually, you know, but the church is full of hypocrites. And, you know, that's why I'm not going to church, you know. Um, but in reality, um, the, the whole fact of them not going to church because churches have people is full of people that are hypocrites. This says a lot about that person, you know. It, it talks about their selfishness and also their hypocrisy, too. Um, because in reality, it takes, it, takes, it takes one to humble themselves and to you know, stoop down or, you know, just go to others that are struggling to, you know? Um, and I think that's how we're going to be saved. We're going to be saved um, by, by, you know, just our character is going to be judged individually, but we are saved by, by selfishly helping others just as Christ did. I don't know if I explained it, though. No, that was great. Um, that was great. Anybody else have anything to add? Before? Yes. The, I was going to say that the purpose of the church is, first thing is we have to know who actually um, instituted the church. And, of course, the Bible does say that um, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. And so having a, a, a church building doesn't mean you go to church because you can have, you can actually go to a church building and yet your mind is somewhere else. Uh, for instance, um, let's say I was actually guilty of that before. Uh, the church service is going, and I'm thinking of Madrid playing the Champions League finals. And so I wasn't even thinking about the church at all. I was thinking of something totally different. But um, I'm going to read this from Hebrews chapter 10. And from verse 20, 19 to verse 25. And this is why we should, uh, that's why um, the church is important as well as our individual um, salvation uh, life. I mean, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And so what is the purpose of the church? Well, when when Christ put the church, it was for 
each people to be uh, to admonish one another, to help um, each person in their spiritual walk. I may learn something, and somebody may learn something different from that same passage, but when we come together and exchanging ideas, then I can learn something new, and that can actually help me, in my case, uh, to strengthen my faith in God's word and his word. Mm. Definitely. I'm grateful for that. All you guys have great thoughts. And I think that was, so Mario, I, all of you guys really basically covered what I was going to cover, the purpose of the church fellowship, right? So Mario read that passage in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, and notice that it was not just um, like there's exhorting, that there's that there's that principle of exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And Damien mentioned that, you know, we see the signs are, are very clear that Christ is coming soon. And so now more than ever, we have to be exhorting one another, uh, admonishing, uplifting. Um, so within that, within that word of exhortation, it's not just, you know, encouragement, but as well as, um, you know, admonishment, I think as well is very important, you know, being able to be held accountable to one another, I think is a very big part of, of what the church is, is, is having those sisters or those brothers in Christ that, hey, brother, I noticed that you didn't really, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, that sister who's saying, you know, sister, I noticed that you're not supposed to be talking to X, Y, and Z, he's a stumbling block in your life, or, you know, what have you. You know what? Yes, sister, that's true. You, so there's that that there's that um, level of accountability as well that takes place within the church um, exhortation. Um, Josh had mentioned um, you had covered that um, that fellowship is important. We are social beings, uh, and so connecting, being able to connect with one another. You know, we're not monks. We're not you know confined to just. Um, ourselves, God created us as social beings to to connect with people, to encourage, and that is one part. And Josh also mentioned the body of Christ. So in First Corinthians chapter twelve, that's where we find that term, the body of Christ. Everyone members, um, you know, with different talents, different spiritual gifts, um, but we are all coming together as part of one body. Who whose head is who? Who is our head? Jesus. Jesus. Right. Jesus. Yeah, it's a little bit hard, right? There's not like immediate dialogue because everyone's muted, right? But, yeah. <laughs> but yes, our head is Christ. <laughs> our head is Christ. And um, and so our purpose as a body is to move forward to to carry the gospel of the three angels' message, um, to prepare his people for his soon return. Um, and then there's that passage in First Thessalonians chapter five eleven. Um Man, I can't remember what that says anymore. Let's, let's, let's see if we can turn there together. I think this has to be in the context of um, us being social beings. Let me check. So Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Oh, yes. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So once again, um, there's that, that aspect or that level of exhortation, comforting, edifying, coming together it it presents to be a little bit more challenging now that we're at social distancing and quarantine in our homes um but the beauty of it is that we still have technology so platforms such as zoom facebook instagram where we can still connect with one another um and still be able to carry out our um our purpose as the body of christ okay so moving on hold on um, um, quickly sorry, for Mario. Uh, i saw your post earlier uh, let's say Satan said to Jesus, you see, with the COVID-19, I closed all the churches. And Jesus said, oh, yeah, actually, I opened a bunch of churches in the homes. So Amen. That's right. And you know what? That's such a good point, Mario, because I feel like we take church for granted. Hmm. Because, you know, when we can't socialize or, you know what I mean? Like when we get that freedom or that, you know, aspect taken taken from us it's like everybody wants to go to church now my mom was like saying that she she can foresee that when church starts to open up again she feels like our, our sanctuary is going to be filled not with just um you know members who have stopped coming to church but members of our community right because they're going to miss that fellowship and they're going to want to so this is this is prime time for us guys as god's people to um connect you know with members of the community members who have fallen away people who might be feeling a little bit more lonely um or you know for, i guess separated from people um this is our opportunity to connect with them and, and um, be the church to them. 
Mm-hmm. At the same time, it's a, it's a dangerous time, you know, because, you know, as you see, you know, my kids see a lot of you know, National Geographic and all these animal um, programs. And you see how these uh, predators, they attack their, you know, the, you know, the antelopes or wildebeest or whatever. And a, a lot of their tactics is just, you know, to, to separate, you know, um, separate the victim, you know, the, the prey. And, um, and just when they separate, you know, the whole herd, it's just much easier for them to just center and, you know, concentrate on one and, and, and kill it, you know. So I believe Satan is doing that too. And that's why what um, Mario was reading, that even the more that we are progressing and getting closer to the end of time, we should come closer, you know, we should unite. We should be, you know, just it's a lot more an intimate relation with one another, um, seeing for the needs of one another, because he, God knows that the, the more we are united and we're together and interested in each other, Satan is going to la- have less um, power over us. But in the contrary, if, if there's people that were wavering and, you know, not wanting to go to church very much, maybe this has pulled a cold, uh, put a cold freeze on their spiritual life. And maybe we need to um, encourage them, you know, to come back and to and to come back to the fold where they're going to be safe, you know, from Satan's temptations. Great thoughts, great thoughts. And, you know, I'm going to actually pose this question. This is rhetoric. This is for you just to kind of file and put in into your um, things to ponder on. But some of you know people. Um, there's probably a, a name that instantly comes to mind when you think of per- somebody who has maybe um, been a little, like what Josh was mentioning, not kind of cold, right, in their walk with God, who have kind of um, not valued or have not, you know, have have been thinking about you take some time off and have that conversation with them whether it just be like a, a true interesting conversation and in how they're doing and possibly engaging them in uh, you know in, in making a commitment to return um, to God whether it be that moment or you know successive conversations after um, but anyways so moving back to the early Adventists and um, their disappointing times um, in their study of the 2300 day prophecy um, Okay, so fulfilling God's mission um, will be a path lined with obstacles, tests of faith, and trials. That was one thing that that really stood out to me as I was reading through this chapter. Um, One passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul is telling a young Timothy this, that, you know, you're going to go through a lot of things, Timothy. You're taking up the, the call to, to uh, you know, work for the work for our master, but it's not going to be a, you know, a path lined with roses. Um, the enemy is most active against God's people. So Damien mentioned that um, passage in 396, paragraph 1. I thought it was kind of interesting. So it did mention um, Luther and the Wesleyans, the early reformers. But you can see that Satan, um, every ground that God's people are and he's trying his best to uh, to shake that ground. Um, in all of the history of the church, no reformation has been carried forward with encountering serious obstacles. Paul encountered those obstacles, State, um, Wesley, um, Swingley, you guys have been studying through the early reformers, Luther, and um, and that is, I think, a serious warning that we as Christians need to keep in mind, that when we desire to follow um, to follow Christ, it's not going to be easy. And that has been something that I've been struggling with, um, that I struggled with since I was, you know, in high school, right? Something that, well, then, like, why are, you would think that these commitments that you're making to God, these decisions, they would incur, they would help, it would help you, you know, your, your life would be easier, but it's quite the contrary. Um, we don't have, like, a prosperity gospel where when you serve God, everything becomes, like, you know, flowers and, and rainbows. Um and it's interesting because they're one of the great attacks on their message was that they were fanatics. Like, oh man, um, you guys 
that's what a fanatical message you know how are you ever to think that god is coming he doesn't almost like noah right when noah was what was preaching the word um was preaching that the flood was coming everybody thought he was a fanatic and and he was saying i mean what is rain these people had never seen rain before they'd never known that water could ever fall from the sky um and noah was preaching this message that not it wasn't just going to fall from the sky but it was going to actually destroy the whole world they thought he was a fanatic and so it was with the early adventists um but on the flip side the pendulum also swings and fanaticism was also actually resulting in that um people from the early adventist group people who had joined the movement um or who were already in the movement um they started to um kind of become like fanatics and to end out they were um you know well i think of um, examples in history like they were selling all that they had um they were you know left with nothing um you know just doing all these all these things right that was not exactly practical or uh you know yeah practical um so the enemy is a roaring lion it's definitely um he comes to deceive and um just like we talked about earlier our foundation needs to be the word of god demi it looks like he has something to say uh no i was i don't know uh, i was gonna mention 397.1 Go for it, go for it. Uh, kind of like with, you know, the whole thing with fanatics, when I says, uh, and not content with misrepresenting and exaggerating the errors uh, of extremists and fanatics, they circulated unfavorable reports uh, that had not the slightest semblance of truth. Uh, it says these persons uh, were actuated by prejudice and hatred. Uh, and then here's here's what part I like the most. Their peace was disturbed by the proclamation of Christ at the door. Uh, they feared mm-hmm. it might be true, yet hoped it was not. And, uh, and then it continues, it says, and this uh, was the secret of their, uh, their warfare against Adventists and their faith. So I feel like it's like part of them was like, you know, like, uh, is this like true? Is it, <laughs> is it not, you know? Um, I just think it's crazy that even, even the people who hated it, who were against like, you know, who, who were, who were like against like the Reformation or whatever, they, you know, against God's people. Um, even they thought, you know, they, they, they questioned themselves, which is interesting. Um, and also one thing I wanted to share was um, where it says they, they feared it might be true, yet hoped it was not. Um, I think it's really interesting because, like, that could even be us at times. Like, sometimes, like, we could be, like, I, and I speak for myself, like, man, like, I want to do this. Like, you know, I want to go to school. I want to get married. I want to have kids, you know, and, like, all these things. Um, like, it's kind of like we want extra time here on earth, you know what I mean? Like, you, you fear it might be true, but you hope it's not, you know, like the, the coming of the Lord is near. But I think that's a, that's a dangerous thing to be because, you know, what God has to offer is much more special than anything that we could hope for here on earth. Great thoughts, I man. You're right. You're, and um, I you, you mentioned how um, those that, that these persons were actuated by prejudice and hatred, right? So like their message was like actually getting them even more angry. I think, of, I'm, like I mentioned, I was reading through the book of um, the Patriarchs and Prophets and I think about Saul and how uh, even like, like his mind was so darkened by his sins and his, you know, succumbing to that. And um, I remember reading, I can't remember, I think it was in Patriarchs and Prophets where, um, every time he had like, even though David's intentions were always good and how David, you know, we know that David feared Saul and he loved Saul, he even mourned for Saul when Saul had, when Saul had died. Uh, but every time that David had something to tell him, or, you know, even if it was a, just, just a, not even advice or whatever, he, it was like, um, he would get so upset and so angry towards that. And such is the action or the reaction of, um, of God's enemies or of, of those people who hate God's truth, you know, who have been so blinded by sin. Um, and then kind of touching on your thought about how we want, we want to buy extra time. I think it's true. And it's kind of sad. It, and it's a reflection. It's a, it's an opportunity for us to kind of self-reflect and say, like, do I truly love God the way I should be? And that's a prayer that I've been trying to pray. Cause I can, I've, I'm, I'm in the same boat as a man like I find myself thinking wow like 
have we ever like experienced a plague of this enormity? And as I read Revelation and I think of, you know, like, you know, just the signs that are going to come like in Matthew 24, all these, you know, the pestilence and all these signs that are, you know, marking Christ's soon return. Um, I think to myself, man, I hope it's not true. But then I, I catch myself and I think, wow, that's such an awful thought. Why would I hope it's not true when I, as God's people, I should be grateful and, and look, lift up my head because my redemption is drawing nigh. And um, so I don't know. Do you guys want to have anything else you want to add? Um, as the, so as the early Adventists continue to preach, um, the work is at four o'clock already. What time did we start? We started at three, right? What time yeah, do you, what time do you guys? We usually finish, finish like, we, we do about an hour, but. Okay. Time. So I guess we'll start wrapping up now so that we don't, um, take up too much time, but, um, there was one thing that I really wanted to talk about um, was this. The results of um, the first angel's message being preached. And I think I'm going to probably finish off here. Um, was that when when God's message was, when the first angel's message was being preached and people were, um, you know, after the first disappointment or, you know, like that first time where they had thought that Christ was coming and they had returned to the word, um, they Notice what the result was. Um, it says, carefully and solemnly, those who received the message came up to the time when they hoped to meet their Lord. Every morning they felt that it was their first duty to secure the evidence of their acceptance with God. Their hearts were closely united and they prayed much with and for one another. They often met together in secluded places to commune with God and the voice of intercession ascended to heaven from the fields and groves. I love this. The assurance of the Savior's approval was more necessary to them than their daily food. And if a cloud of dark, uh, if a cloud darkened their minds, they did not rest until it was swept away. As they felt the witness of pardon and grace, they longed to behold him who, whom their souls loved. Like, that is so powerful to me, guys. Like, to think that they desired God's approval more than life itself and more than food itself, right? Right, because that's how... I put there, um, like, I had, like, that same quote, and I wrote for Matthew 6, uh, verse 33. National, oh, Matthew 6, Put, oh, put the kingdom of God first, you know. First, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, seek first God's kingdom, you know, and seek first everything that you know pertains to Him. Uh, to seek for Him truly, you know. Yeah, when right. I when I read that part, I um I thought about my my myself, and I said, you know, why why am I not in that same attitude, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's because uh, there is there's a word, you know, we we talked about the word of God and our personal salvation. Um, but I, I think we need to talk a little bit about faith, you know, because um, in Hebrews 4, it says that talking about God's people in, in, in the desert when they were, you know, traveling towards uh, the promised land, it says that many of them or most of them, you know, laid in the ground in, in, in their graves and they're in the desert because they lacked faith. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have faith to, you know, to have them, you know, go into the promised land and obtain the promises of God, you know. They didn't go into the rest of God um, because they didn't have that faith. And the question is, do we have that faith? Do we really believe, you know, we talk about it. You know, one thing is to say, yeah, this, this pandemic is a big sign that Jesus is coming. But if there's no reformation or any revival if there's no modification of my life if, if it's not seen you know by my attitude even towards my neighbors and everything my family members i mean it's all just gibberish you know it's not just i'm not i'm not gonna it's not trash but i mean in my life I, i'm i'm basically trashing the truth you know um and it has no power in me so I would say, you know, if we believed, if we knew by some inspiration that Jesus was coming at the end of this week, I would bet you guys anything, our lives would be like this. You know what I'm saying? I would yeah. bet anything. We would, we would not sleep for a week. 
we would not sleep for a week. We would all just look at what we're eating, how we're dressing, what are, you know, what am I using my time in? We would not be sleeping because we'd be praying all night, you know. But the question is, why am I not having the attitude? I can die tomorrow. Or well, today. I can die tomorrow. And not only that, and Jesus' second coming can be, you know, in a week or two. You never know. It's going to be as a thief in the night. And the thief in the night is, you know, that Michael standing up at time of probation ending. It could be any moment. So I believe God is calling us and he's asking us, do you have faith? And and I see, I read recently, you know, what Jesus told Peter, asked Peter after he denied him. And he, he asked him three times, you know, do you really love me? And Peter says, you know, you know, everything, Master, I love you. And, you know, the third time that says that Peter was grieved. And he told him, Master, you know I love you. And and I think those piercing words come to us, you know, because the question is, you know, Jesus is actually protesting to us as a church. You are, you think you're, you think, you think you're rich. You think you know everything. You think, you know, you have the light. Um, but in reality, I'm going to tell you what something. In reality, you're wretched, man. You're poor. You're miserable. It's like you're scum. You know what I mean? Humble ourselves before the Lord. To humble ourselves and just like David, you know, ask him to to um, examine our hearts and to, and to and try us, yes, and try especially. And I, I fear that we might be in that group that would say at the end, you know, Lord, Lord, you know, we preach, we did a bunch of Zoom groups, you know, we had tried to help others. And at the end, Jesus might say, you know what? I don't know you. I yeah. never had this good experience with you. you. You never, I was knocking at the door of your heart. Through those things you were preaching, I was knocking at you, at your heart asking you to come in relations intimate relation with me but you never opened your heart so so i think guys that god is calling us to um to really examine ourselves and see if, if we really have faith in this and what we were preaching what we're studying if we are really applying it to our life you know noah believed god it says he believed god and he prepared an ark where he and his family could go in so I, mean, I would I would ask you guys, you know, are your neighbors hearing the coming down of the of the hammer on the nails, you know? Are your mm -hmm. neighbors hearing, you know, the your saws going, you know, preparing that arc? You know, are are your schoolmates or coworkers, are they are they hearing you how you build that arc, you know? Wow. And if they're not, I mean something is really wrong. Something is really wrong. Um uh, I, there's a lot of visions from Sister White and I know we don't have time right now, but she, she talks in length about those that think they're going to be saved and in the great time of trouble, it says that their wails or their cries were much above, would go above, you know, the wails or the cries of the, of the impenitent or the, um, or, the, or the wicked ones, you know? Why? Because they had the truth and they didn't believe it and they're lost the same as the wicked. You know, if, if you don't have that faith, it would be better for us just to go out to the world and enjoy the world, you know? I mean... <laughs> Go enjoy the world while it lasts, you know. But if you take the, the name of Christ on you, on yourself as a banner on your life, you better take it right. You better, you know, have that faith because, you know, whoever has more light, Jesus said, it, he's going to have more whips, you know. He's going to have more chastises when Jesus comes. So it would be best for us to, to see if we really have faith in this message. Man, those are some great points. I that. That really hit hard when Noah prepared an ark and are your neighbors, are your coworkers, are your classmates hearing you prepare that ark? That can that's a that's a very sobering thought for us to examine and see are they, you know? This chapter um, ends with Hebrews chapter 10, 35. I'm just gonna read it for you. Um, where it says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Uh, for you have need of um, patience. After you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just live by, by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. 
And God's, the early Adventists, they were the ones, like Josh was mentioning, who lived by faith. We're talking about knowledge of the word of God. We're talking about being grounded and salvation being personal. But just like Josh was saying, that our it's faith. The just live by faith. And so being able to, um, and, and what Hebrews the next actually the following chapter hebrews 11 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and it's being able to believe and and hold fast even though we can't see um the promise um even though we don't know the end from the beginning we trust that god's will is greater and that we're going to obey um so those are just and so yeah those are just things um to kind of think on um despite the seemingly delay that the lord would tarry the early Adventists never, you know, let go. Um, they held on. They lived by faith. They never renounced their faith. They never drew back to perdition. Um, but they continued to believe um, to the saving of the soul. And I, that's um, that's um, a message for us. These are some just things, questions to ponder on for us is that, um, what are some current disappointments and discouragements you may be facing in your life? How has your faith in God and foundation his word been helping you through this trial? Can you come up higher in this area? Um, has your study of God's word resulted in personal revival and forsaking of sins, just like those in the early Adventist church? Um, how can our study better yield personal commitments, change in a closer walk with God? Um, and then the commitment that I would like for us to make this week is um, found in one of my favorite hymns, I Will Follow Thee, My Savior. And um, the hymn goes, I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoe'er my lot may be, where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow thee. And there's that commitment. I will follow thee, my Savior. Why? Because you shed your blood for me. You have been so good to me. You have... You know, you have loved me so much. I, the least I could do is love you in return. And though all men should forsake me, forsake thee, by thy grace I'll follow thee. Though the road be rough and thorny, trackless as the foaming sea, thou hast trod this way before me, and I'll gladly follow thee. Um, though I meet with tribulation, sorely tempted though I be, I remember thou wast tempted and rejoice to follow thee. Though thou leadest me through affliction, poor forsaken though I be, thou wast destitute, afflicted, and I only follow thee. Though to Jordan's rolling billows, cold and deep, thou leadest me, thou hast crossed the waves before me, and I still will follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all men should forsake me, by thy grace I'll follow thee. And so I want to make that proposition to you guys is that is that something that you're willing is that a commitment that you're willing to personally take just through all the discouragements, through all the trials, um, through all the ups and downs that we're going to make that personal commitment to follow Christ. Why? Because he shed his blood for us, because he loves us. And amidst the disappointments, you know, amidst everything, we're going to hold on to our faith, knowing that that's what's going to be the one to see us through. Is that a commitment you guys want to make to Christ today? Amen. I know it. I know it's something that I do. And by God's grace, um, we'll be able to hold on and um, our foundation in his word, our faith in him. Um, our experience with him, the Holy Spirit's um, presence in our lives will be with Jesus through till he comes. Um, let's close in prayer. Um, I don't know, babe, how do you guys usually close this off? Uh, Just end in prayer. End in prayer. Okay. How about you? Um, so I was, okay. I guess after we finish the, the prayer, then we can give the announcement for next Saturday. Okay. Oh, yeah, Mario's going to be having it next Saturday. Okay. Let's close with prayer, and then we'll proceed with announcements. Precious Father in heaven, God, thank you for the example of um, the early church. Thank you for the example of Jesus and how uh, they were grounded in your word, how Christ himself, Father, had, he was so dependent on that um, communion with you, how the early Adventists, they were so founded on the word and um, searched the word so diligently, um, despite um, the, the bumps along the road, despite the disappointment, um, their faith was so strong and founded on you. Father in heaven, we want that experience. Oh Lord, we know that you are coming very soon. And Father in heaven, we pray and ask that you will search and examine our hearts, that there will be 
no good way found in us. And Father, if there is, oh Lord, I pray that that will make me very clear to us and give us the courage and the strength to forsake those, oh God, to be made new through the blood of the Lamb, to live um, to live lives that are worthy, oh Father, um, and fit to meet you. Um, be with us. Help us to um, be refreshed and renewed and ready, Father, to um, come to, to meet the new week. And thank you so much for all that you do for us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, so I was going to say that um, next service, or this service, we're going to look at GC uh, chapter 23, talking about the what is the sanctuary. And I was I was gonna do it in two parts because it's a very uh, well not because it's too long, but it's there's so much to cover. And I wouldn't cover it, cover everything, and so I'll do a part one this coming Sabbath, and then part two after that next Sabbath. Sounds good. Thanks, Mario. Right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everyone that joined. Thanks, Casey. Hey, guys. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. 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 Hey, Jacob. Well, uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, I will see you next Sabbath at 3 p.m. Uh, Central Time. So, 3 p.m. Central Time. Until then, have a happy Sabbath, and hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.